proof of stake. Is proof of stake just an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine? Quoting from Samson Mao, proof of stake doesn't really work because it is essentially perpetual energy. Proof of stake, it's secure because you know everyone has a stake in it, but they're ignoring external threats. What if you have a competing network? What if you have Justin Sun with Tron who's trying to overtake Ethereum? He could just buy out some of the stake and attack the network, or a hacker. But it's more likely a competing network would be incentivized to destroy a proof of stake because if they destroy one network, another network goes up. So uh, this is a complex question. I don't actually agree with uh, Samson in this particular analysis of uh, proof of stake. For one thing, one of the challenges with uh, the idea of what if someone buys enough stake is exactly the same challenge that you have with proof of work um, and markets in general. What if someone buys uh, a big chunk of Bitcoin in order to crash the market by then dumping it on the market? I mean, after all, governments have billions of dollars. Couldn't they just buy up uh, most of the Bitcoin in supply and then dump it? Uh, what if someone buys uh, all of the ASICs that are coming out of manufacturing plants, or buys lots and lots of ASICs and then uses them to attack the network? Uh, what if someone uh, buys all of the stake of a coin? The truth is that the action of going into a market and massively increasing demand in order to get a substantial proportion of the currency, or the ASICs, uh, or the mining power, etc., um, has a side effect, and that side effect, of course, is that you're driving up the price as you're doing it. And that, that price action will be asymptotic, which means that effectively, the more um, you buy, the higher you drive up the price, and the more constrained the supply becomes, um, the more you fail to buy up significant amount, amounts of the currency or the ASICs, because um, the last uh, percentage of supply, uh, the price of the last percentage of supply, of course, approaches infinity as you approach that element of supply. And no matter what, in any market like that, the amount of supply that is currently available uh, to purchase is low compared to the amount of supply uh, that has already been purchased in the market, but is not available to buy. Uh, I, ironically, in Bitcoin, we call that the stock-to-flow model. Um, and it's, a, it's basically a fundamental principle for why Bitcoin uh, theoretically has a great price appreciation potential. Because the actual stock of available Bitcoin versus the flow of new Bitcoin that's available on the market to buy, um, that ratio is pretty high. Uh, that means that there's not enough Bitcoin available on the market vis-a-vis -vis the stock of Bitcoin that is fixed and not available to buy. Same thing applies when you're talking about proof-of-stake systems. Um, so keep in mind, while you're buying up um, the, the percentage of stake, um, you're also increasing the value of the currency that other people already have and creating demand for it. There is a theoretical possibility that you could do this. Um, however, that is no different than the possibility of doing something similar to crash the market with Bitcoin or doing something similar to crash the market by buying up all of the ASICs. I don't really see the analogy, um, and I disagree with this. Um, that doesn't mean that I know that proof of stake can work at scale and resist attacks as well as proof of work. I do believe that proof of work has a higher qualitative uh, immunity element than uh, proof of stake. Essentially, the, Im the uh, immutability that is provided by proof of work is different uh, and better than the immutability provided by proof of stake. In a proof-of-work system, it costs money to change the past because you have to expend the energy. Even if you have 100% of the mining, you still have to do the work to change the past. You still have to uh, pr produce proof-of-work. You also still have to follow the rules of consensus or you end up forking the network. Because 
the economic activity of the network, which is concentrated in exchanges, merchants and users, their wallets and nodes that they are operating will not follow a different set of rules, just because you change them with the mining power. Same thing applies with proof of stake. You can't just unilaterally change the rules, um, but there is less cost in changing the past. Can staking and DeFi or decentralized finance coexist? I recently came across several articles about how DeFi could hurt cryptocurrencies whose consensus model is built on proof of stake. And there's a link there to that Medium article, which was a really interesting, interesting read. You can find that in the questions section. Um, the author basically reasoned that one can simply take over most of the stakes from a cryptocurrency by offering its users more attractive rewards somewhere else in a DeFi project. What do you think about this opinion? So, to, to paraphrase a bit, when you have staking uh, in a proof of stake system, you put up your staked coin. Let's say Ether, although Ether is currently a proof of work system, but is planning to go to proof of stake. Um, you put up your Ether in uh, the proof of stake system in order to ensure the security of the network, and that Ether then uh, can earn a tiny bit of uh, reward effectively through the block subsidy from the new Ether that's being generated in each new block. Now, um, that's not the only way to earn money on Ether. In fact, the whole uh, field of decentralized finance has emerged with a whole bunch of financial products that are built on uh, smart contracts. Uh, examples of those include um, Dai, uh, the stable coin, the decentralized stable coin by MakerDAO, uh, but also a bunch of other pro uh, projects like uh, Compound and Dharma and others that allow you to do things like lending. And of course, when you're lending uh, to others, uh, you're using your ether as collateral in order to do lending. And <coughs> or to borrow a different token. And in that case, you earn interest uh, through that lending activity. And so what happens is the interest that is being produced from lending is better than the return that is being produced by staking your coins in proof of stake. Well, a rational economic actor in that case would, uh, would move their coins from the, uh, from the staking to some kind of lending platform in order to uh, make a better return on their investment. And if you follow that train of thought further, uh, you could arrive at a point where a lot of people move from staking their coins instead to lending or investing their uh, coins in a variety of decentralized finance instruments. And that means that the pool of stakers uh, is pretty small, which makes it easier for someone to take over uh, the proof of stake algorithm, um, the equivalent of what would be a 51% attack in a proof of work system is a you know a, a one third uh, staking attack in a proof of stake system. You have to have about two thirds of the staking actors acting honestly, and um, there's two ways to beat that system. One is to put up more stake than everybody else, but the other is to simultaneously reduce the stake that everybody else is putting up. And one way to do that is to artificially drive up the interest rates or returns on decentralized finance products. At least that's the theory behind this and other articles that have been written on this topic. Now this gets a bit more complicated because the actual return you get from staking depends on the monetary policy of the underlying cryptocurrency. So, if you are operating in a network that is inflationary, then there is a continuous block subsidy which generates returns for those staking. But what if you had a, a neutral or deflationary monetary policy, at which point you no longer have uh, block subsidy generating lavish rewards, but instead the rewards were diminishing over time, then that drives even more pressure uh, for people to make better returns in an open market by staking the coins uh, in a, at a decentralized finance project instead of putting them as stake against the proof of stake system. All of this is very complicated. Uh, this is part of the dynamic nature of open markets and economics in this new realm. And uh, honestly, nobody knows exactly how this is going to play out. And part of the reason we don't know is because 
uh, people behave differently uh, at scale and with real money at stake than they do uh, on paper or when simulated uh, in a uh, financial simulation, uh, an agent-based simulation, as, as one mentioned in that article. So we're going to have to see. One interesting thing that I didn't see mentioned is the possibility of being able to have uh, your Ether simultaneously collateralizing a loan and staked against proof of stake. Uh, I don't know if that's possible, but uh, it might be possible uh, to stake coins that are collateralized in a smart contract against the proof of stake algorithm, in which case some of this problem goes away. And again, no good answers here. This is one of those we're going to have to see how it plays out. Uh, and certainly this interplay between how much uh, money is locked in decentralized finance uh, contracts uh, versus how much is locked in proof of stake it is going to be a very, very interesting development as uh, proof of stake coins develop in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free, so if you want to support it, join me on Patreon.